Welcome to the conference session titled Understanding Transplant Options. Thank you for joining us. My name is Alice Hauck, Senior Director of Patient and Professional Services at AAMDSIF, and I will be moderating the presentation today. As we get started, we recognize the generosity of the corporate sponsors and the generous support of patients, families, and caregivers for supporting the conference today. Immediately following the presentation, there will be a question and answer session. Please feel free to submit questions at any time during the presentation from the Q&A icon in the engagement panel on your right. To submit a question or comment, type your question in the Q&A text box window, and when you have finished typing your question, hit enter. We will do our best to get to all questions. When asking questions, I respectfully ask that you do two things to help us manage the incoming questions. First, submit the entire question all at the same time. And second, please do not share private health information in your question. Our speakers cannot answer any specific questions related to your health care. Today's specialist is Dr. Jayla Ustin. Dr. Ustin is a professor of medicine, the Coleman Foundation Chair of Hematology and Bone Marrow Transplant at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. He is also director of the section of bone marrow transplant and cell therapy in the division of hematology, oncology, and cell therapy at Rush. Dr. Ustin's area of expertise, areas of expertise are bone marrow transplantation, especially relapse presentation, myeloid malignancies, and systemic mastocytosis. Welcome, Dr. Ustin. Thank you, Alice, so much. And I'm honored to be here. Uh, I'm gonna, as you mentioned, um, talk about transplantation options in uh, bone marrow failure uh, diseases. I am a hematologist. I'm directing uh, cell therapy, uh, bone marrow transplantation at Rush University. These are my disclosures, although it is not relevant. I had uh, Honoria from Novartis and Blueprint for educational and advisory board activities. So, when we talk about bone marrow, we talk about stem cells. And what we are mentioning is that the, the cells um, in the bone marrow, we call them uh, the stem cells. I call them blood-making mother cells. Uh, they develop three uh, major uh, blood types for us. Uh, one of them is red blood cells that carries the oxygen from lungs to any other organs. And when we have low red blood cells, we call it anemia. Uh, these patients unfortunately feel so tired and require red blood cell or blood transfusions all the time. The second type of blood cells are called uh, white blood cells. As you, you know, it, they fight with infections. And if we have low white blood cells, we are prone to develop all kinds of infections and that, that can be uh, life-threatening. Uh, the third part, uh, third type of cells are very tiny cells. We call them platelets. As you may know, they make the clot and uh, when particularly we have bleeding, they stop the bleeding. So as you can imagine how important these cells for survival and stem cells to make the cells every single day. Uh, here you can see on the left side, one of the bone marrow biopsy, uh, the um, purple ones are the normal blood cells and blood making mother cells. And on the right hand side, you can see all white uh, because uh, the white cells are cells, fat cells. So it is fatty bone marrow, no bone marrow um, blood making cells in the bone marrow, obviously right presents a bone marrow failure disease. And bone marrow failure syndromes are um, complex and overlap each other. Uh, three major ones, uh, myelodysplastic syndrome mainly uh, occurs in elder populations. On the other hand, aplastic anemia, um, another bone marrow failure disease, but mainly occurs, mostly occurs in younger group. And these um, two bone marrow failure syndromes overlaps with other uh, disorders, particularly uh, paroxysmal nocturnal uh, hemoglobinuria, 
and this can progress this each disease can progress to each other and overlap to each other um i want to mention this is although picture is very pretty uh, this is aspergillus why i want to mention this because bone marrow failure patients um, will have very low white blood cells, particularly neutrophils, and therefore are prone to develop infections. And these infections are, can be very subtle to the some point, and then they activate and can be very life-threatening in the short term. Aspergillus is a fungus, and it is in the air, uh, particularly can be found in construction sites, and it goes to the lung, when it goes to the lung in immunocompromised person, unfortunately can be very, very dangerous. It develops this um, round, uh, big lesions and they grow inside of it and it can be multiple, easily cause uh, um, lung failure, respiratory failure, and it can be in the sinus and from sinus, it can go to the brain. And oh, as you can imagine, how dangerous it can be. And aspergillus type of infections are opportunistic infections and very common in uh, bone marrow failure patients. So bone marrow transplantation is that, so if the, in this bone marrow failure syndromes, one way or another reason, the stem cells, the bone, blood making mother cells are sick. And therefore, what if we get these uh, stem cells from a healthy person, and collect them, and after collection, sometimes processing is necessary, sometimes not, and, and preserve them in a very sophisticated refrigerator, I call. It's a liquid nitrogen, goes down to the minus 270 degree Fahrenheit tanks, and in which they can survive for decades, perhaps. Uh, obviously, we would not wait for uh, years, but uh, we save the cells, sometimes freshly, um, uh, give the patients. The patients, meanwhile, get some sort of chemotherapy and immunosuppressive therapy before the uh, cells are given. Cells are given very simplistically, like blood transfusions, many of you perhaps received, and then the cells goes to the bone marrow, which is their home, and start growing and making cells for the patient. So this is bone marrow transplantation. The stem cell transplantation and bone marrow transplantation may be sometimes confusing. Is it, is it the same thing? Uh, it is very interchangeable. Um, if we collect the stem cells from bone marrow, as you see here, the donor, uh, the individual is in the uh, operating room under general anesthesia. Two providers are uh, getting uh, bone marrow aspirates, uh, leaders of it over hours. Um, this is called bone marrow transplantation. Uh, if we use these cells, if we collect the stem cells from the individual, um, but that, as you see, awake, eating, drinking, whatever she wants to, and watching TV for five hours through this machine, we call it a phrases machine, takes the blood, centrifuges in the uh, machine and collect stem cells in this bag and, and gives the all other cells back to the uh, individual. Mim by which we collect stem cells too, we call it peripheral blood stem cell collection. Uh, there are some differences, and these differences in many diseases may not be important, but it's very important in aplastic anemia um, because bone marrow is better in aplastic anemia patients. So there can there be another um, source for stem cell transplantation? And the answer is yes. Uh, when after the uh, baby is born, uh, it was found that the co umbilical cord has uh, quite a bit stem cells, and that cells are collected uh, and saved in, in banks, uh, cord blood banks, uh, and in, in, in which the stem cells can be used for another individual as a um, stem cell uh, source. We call this umbilical cord blood transplantation. Allogeneic stem cell transplantation in the United States has been uh, increasing, uh, all type of it. However, 
is specifically one type is increasing dramatically. I want to mention that because it might be important to you, uh, very likely will be important to you if you need transplantation, which is called half match or haplo transplantation because the donor was an issue um, in, in the past. Uh, you have to have HLA matching. Um, and finding a full HLA match person, individual as a donor was a difficult task, not always happened for everyone. And over, over a decade or so, uh, John Hopkins group came up with a very revolutionary idea. It was, so interesting and they showed that that idea can allow us to use half match donors half match means that uh, can be father for a patient or mother because we get this 10 numbers five from father five from mother so half match can be father mother for a young individual for a older individual it can be a son or daughter. If it, and in fact, siblings, if they are not full match, can be half match. So you can imagine the donor problem has really minimized after half match transplantation is um, widespread now, is available uh, for all kinds of diseases. As you can see here, uh, over time, allogeneic uh, transplantation number is not only increasing, but also you can see that we are doing more and more, excuse me, uh, older patients' transplantations. Uh, and nowadays, really, there is no uh, cutoff for the age. Uh, is it we, our center, we go up to 75, but if I have a, a fit person, 76, 78, 77, can I do transplantation? Yes. So uh, the age, cutoff is, is disappearing and more and more older patients are getting transplantation, particularly remembering that uh, MDS, myelodysplastic syndrome is an older patient disease. So uh, this is particularly important for MDS. Um, so this is, this is an indication for transplantation. You can see that MDS is, is a quite a bit, um, uh, quite high in terms of indication, somewhere around 2,000 2, patients per uh, in 2019 got transplantation for MDS or MPN, myeloperosis neoplasm. But aplastic anemia is a rare disease, rarer disease, and therefore uh, the, the small number in terms of uh, uh, transplant uh, patients receive transplantation. So here is HLA typing. It's HLA typing is important. There's 10 numbers, uh, five from father, five from mother. Um, define us how to react to other individual or other creature. Or um, if to, when I talk to my patient, I say, so our immune system works very basically, obviously that's not simple, but when we, our immune system, which is white blood cells, which uh, encounter with an entity in our body, ask a simple question, this is me or not me? If the answer is not me, uh, has to be destroyed. That's why we fight with infections. That's why we fight with infect cancers because they are not us. They are different than us. And any differences, these 10 numbers um, uh, in genes, we call it HLA, uh, define us how we react, how severely we react. In 10 numbers, we want a full match, 10 out of 10. However, uh, like I, I mentioned, um, it can be a half match transplantation possible nowadays. If not, what happens? Uh, because uh, you can see here, I, I cannot really read this language, but it's so beautifully uh, and simply uh, presented. So I, I put this on my presentations. So the donor 
and gives to the, 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 the recipient. So the donor is here, recipient is here. If donor doesn't match with the recipient, after transplantation, these donor cells grow and make white cells. White cells brings the immune system and the donor recognize the recipient as a foreign body. And if they, when it recognizes foreign body, it attacks it, which means that graft is attacking host, graft versus host disease. And unfortunately it can be dangerous. It can be dangerous again, very nicely pictured here. Uh, there are uh, this GVHT, uh, the skin gets attacked by the donor, patients develop rash. GI tract get attacked by the donor, patients develop diarrhea or nausea. Liver gets attacked by the uh, donor and the patients develop jaundice. As you can imagine, it can be um, uh, serious and sometimes life-threatening. Uh, allergenic transplantations not only have acute complications, but has chronic complications too. Particularly, this might be important for young individuals. Uh, one of them is late graft versus host disease, and uh, it may affect the, their quality of life. In young individuals, also because of chemotherapy and radiation therapy before transplantation, although the, the, the um, intensity of this therapy generally is not as high as in malignant diseases we use, can cause growth retardation, infertility, make cataract development, uh, bone uh, health, affects the bone health, sometimes thyroid dysfunction, or perhaps because of the chemotherapy, they may develop secondary cancers. However, this is important to remember that aplastic anemia, PNH, or MDS patients by itself uh, have uh, pro, um, tendency to develop secondary cancers uh, because of the the, the genetic uh, abnormalities they have over time. So I want to talk about three diseases and transplantation, MDS, aplastic anemia, and PNH today. And mostly I would like to start with the MDS. MDS is an older uh, patient's disease and it's a spectrum of disease. It's not one, everybody has the same disease and, and it's progressive. We, we need to remember that. Um, patients can be at low risk, this low risk, high risk, depends on their blood counts and, and genetic markers, et cetera. We, we have a very good scoring systems. So every time when we diagnose someone, we put them into where you are in the spectrum. It's very important because that defines what type of risk you should take for the treatment. And if you don't know it, then you will you very likely get wrong uh, therapy for your disease. The MDS progresses two ways. One is the stem cells are sick, not making blood for you, enough blood cells, white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. And it can be combination. Someone have severe anemia, someone has normal uh, platelets, someone has very low white blood cells, depending on, it's everybody is different, but, at the end, it progresses. Everybody gets to the severe degrees of cytopenias, which low blood counts, and then it affects their life because they now transfusion dependent, platelet transfusion to stop bleeding, to prevent bleeding. Because if you bleed into the brain, it's a stroke and it is too late now. Uh, if we, we can catch opportunistic infections, like I showed uh, aspergillus bacteria uh, viruses, um, and the, the, your, your, um, the, this patient's uh, defense mechanism for the, for example, viral infections of COVID will be even harder. So, and this progresses over time for sure. It is not a stable disease. Uh, and the second progression is, although it progresses over time, some patients are very close to the AML, leukemia, because we have in our, this patient's we call it blast or leukemic cells. Over time, these leukemic cells increases and turn into the AML, and which is a different disease. And treatment is much more aggressive because without treatment, AML 
unfortunately caused the patient loss in months. So, so we need to know where the disease is. Why? And, and, and here you can see that in different colors, it affects the person's uh, life. And it tells us where the person is, tells us how expected, how many lifespan expected to remain uh, in this person. So we have to, we can predict it. Obviously it's not 100%, but we can predict it by thousands of prior MDS patients. You can see that it is dramatically different. These all patients have MDS here, but the blue curve, you can see that uh, enjoyed much longer survival. Let's say median, for, median survival is happened in 10 years. However, if you look at the red curve, these patients died and 50% of them died in one year. Almost all of them died in four years. So we have to choose the right therapy. Uh, and, and therefore, who should get transplantation is a very important question. And see here very clearly, uh, high risk patient survival only eight months but low risk patient is eight years. So this is not the same disease. When you, you were diagnosed or someone was diagnosed, you had MDS is not enough. What risk of MDS I have, that needs to be addressed and it can be addressed at diagnosis so that we can choose the right therapy. So what is the right therapy? Here you can see that it's a retrospective analysis uh, in, in thousands of patients. So the the yellow is non-transplant, blue is transplant. And you see in the low risk group, non-transplant did better. So low risk don't do transplant. But if you have high risk MDS, transplant did better. So high risk patients should get transplant. Is it true in the prospective study? And it is just published, just published two months ago. Um, it and I can I emphasize here the upper age, 75 years old. So if you know someone who has MDS and in his 60s or 70s, and someone says you are too old for transplantation, is not true. We do transplantations, like I said, no uh, maximum age nowadays. Um, uh, this study included 75 years old, up to 75 years old, and the youngest was 50. Um, and high-risk patients, it has to be high-risk patients. They were included high-risk patients. And if they had a matched sibling or unrelated donor, uh, then they got transplantation. If they didn't, they got chemotherapy. So they still get treated chemotherapy. And within four years, 384 patients were enrolled. It's a large study. It's not easy to do it in 40 centers. It's um, in many, many centers in four years, large study. The idea was the, the objective to see at t three years who, what therapy provided better survival in patients. And here is clear, very clear. It's not iffy results. Overall survival at three years, which was the main um, question. Uh, if in the transplant group, 50% survived at three years, and in the non-transplant group who got chemotherapy, only 25% survived. The difference is huge. And, and the difference in the beginning seemed to be similar because transplantation obviously is more complicated than just getting outside chemotherapy. And some, uh, like I said, GVHD can happen. GVHD may cause of that, but including everything, the separations happens. The transplantation does better, much better. And separation happens after six, after nine months or so, and then stays higher, stays better. And not only the survival, but without disease survival in the right side, you can see that blue provides much better. And in fact, this, Analysis, the first one I just showed it by ass assignment. Okay, you you are assigned a transplant group, you are assigned non-transplant group. But if we if you someone asks, what if they receive the assigned treatment? What happens? In fact, the 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 gap increases. See that um, if patients really get the transplantation, 
really got the transplantation, 50% of so uh, survived. And the red goes down to the 20%. So who receives transplant will almost two times higher chance to survive than non-transplant group. So, and they, the study asks who benefited from the transplant the most? Is there a group, subgroup uh, benefited uh, chemotherapy? And in fact, not. All subgroups benefited from transplantation. One can ask, for example, what about, because age is, you, you are saying older patients, but 65 is different than perhaps 75. And that's a good question. What, what happened here, if you look at less than 65 benefited from transplant, right column is transplant is better. And more than 65 years old here, benefited from transplant as well. So patients 69, 73, 74, compared to 74 years old non-transplant did better with transplantation. What, what were the complications? Of course, there were complications. And tra uh, transplant related mortality in one year, 15%. And uh, 15%, you may say, well, it's, it's it is not nothing correct, but in the in the uh, concept, in the um, if you look at everything, this fifteen percent at one year, the others were dying more because of disease progression and complications. Uh, severe graft versus host disease was very reasonable, seventeen percent. Chronic graft versus host disease, uh, severe ones only happened in twenty three patients. Chronic QHD may affect quality of life. And, and the study looked at the patient's quality of life, not only survival, but also quality. Uh, they month 3, 6, 18, uh, and 36. So each time point, um, bone marrow transplant versus non-transplant were equal. Even person develops chronic QHD, their quality of life was not bad. So this is a register study, CIBMTR. It's uh, all transplant data in the United States goes to the uh, CIBMTR. And you can see here that match-related or unrelated transplantation did not uh, make so much difference, really. Uh, so if you don't have a sibling, you can get match-unrelated transplantation, and you may have the similar outcome. And Importantly, as you, as you can imagine, that uh, as time progresses, we do better and better in transplantation. This is 2001 and 2005, and, and the higher survival, obviously, in the most current ones, 2016 and 2017. Every year, we are going up and up because we know, we know more, we can prevent our um, uh, mortality or death in different ways. Now, you can say, I, I can ask, why we don't do MDS trans, transplantation in MDS more? Why? Because we know that MDS is older patients' disease, and we know that we are aging population. So where is the limitation? Where is the obstacle? And there are many. There are many. And we made it, um, a panel, a national panel, try to address this, how we can, uh, what are the problems that we are not doing transplantation in MDS? The provider-wise, we, we, we taught, lack of awareness of indication. And unfortunately, in community oncologists, um, age still is a, ma it is a matter. People, when I, I heard again and again, I have a patient 60, 65 years old, do you do transplant? Of course we do. Uh, um, they, they don't have this inform the data I showed to you, it's just published. How do we communicate this information? Direct and, and I'm very delighted to be here today to directly tell you the transplantation did better in a prospective study and not just better, much better. So you, I want, we want to break these obstacles and, and directly transfer the information to you. And also we need to, academicians need to uh, reach more community doctors and, and directly tell them 
this is the outcome it's a significant difference um, in patients who get transplantation of course in high risk or intermediate risk not the low risk uh, but you need to know what type of disease what type of risk you have if you have mds uh, obviously there are other problems maybe financial barriers maybe um again people think that i may not have a donor that's that's not the case anymore uh, we need caregivers and someone says i don't have a caregiver that might be a problem in terms of patients uh challenges um uh again the, the knowledge what is the risk everybody thinks about transplantation is complicated can cause your lead to your uh, mortality although it is true but in the context in the, in the context your disease is not a good disease it's gonna cause your mortality by itself and allogeneic transplantation can give you a better survival opportunity if you have that high risk. So, so it is important to put the context, the risks and benefits. Social barriers, language, cultural literacy issues in patients, perhaps uh, needing, obviously you need to come, this patient needs to come to the academic center for transplantation. And transplantation doesn't, is not over when they go home, and we are all happy the first month is over stem cells are coming new cells and making nice cells for you blood cells for the patients but it is not over we need to follow them very closely that's why they need to be living close to our hospitals for 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 a while and is it, a, it can be a problem yeah of course it can be a problem they need to have a caregiver it can be a problem so it's not there are obstacles to do op uh, allogeneic transplantation although this can be done and, and, and education is and and trying to come work with the team team tries to handle a lot of things together insurance issues can be problem undocumented patients can be problem or an optimal donor can be a problem but i said now it's very very limited it was a big problem 10 years ago but not now so what to do and, and just for this purpose, we came together and we, this panel tried to figure out how do we improve this? How do we improve transplantation in MDS? We need to, academic tr transplant centers should communicate with the community oncologists and transfer, translate this data to them. Uh, the payers, uh, the insurance companies needs to accept this. Uh, improve their coverage and widen their coverage to the patients. Pay the patient advocate, advocacy groups like uh, the Aplastic Anemia MDS Foundation, they are doing now such a great job they are doing. And, and we are uh, communicating directly with you and trying to tell you the, the current information directly from us. National Marrow Donor Program has been doing fantastic, but there is a room to improve. The minorities still can have donor problems because they don't have enough uh, enough uh, uh, individuals in the donor pools. So second talk is in aplastic anemia. Aplastic anemia is, like I said, bone marrow failure. Patients generally severe forms are very, it's a very life-threatening situation because of bleeding or infections that can happen anytime. And uh, the studies over years, as you know, you may know, show that aplastic anemia is a yes, stem cell disease, but stem cells are, are also attacked by the immune system, by on, on our immune system. So if we use immunosuppressive drugs, maybe we can regenerate, stem cells can regenerate in the bone marrow, that empty bone marrow becomes a more um, blood making cells and that blood making cells turn into the uh, maturated blood cells that works we call it immunosuppressive therapy and immunosuppressive therapy obviously is a very valid therapy for aplastic anemia severe aplastic anemia and the other one is just not give immunosuppressive therapy but also give the new stem cells which is bone marrow uh, transplantation this first slide shows that immunosuppressive therapy, thankfully, and bone marrow transplantation over time, as someone expect uh, the outcomes 
in both uh, ways of treatment have improved. Um, as you can see, uh, all earlier years, the immunosuppressive therapy provided 56% survival. Now it is 73, even it's better than that. It is 2019, a decade ago. And uh, bone marrow transplantation, the same way, uh, survival got better over time. And uh, EBMT, European Bone Marrow Transplant Group, asked retrospectively, analyzed, they analyzed the question, what is it now? Is it immunosuppressive therapy better or bone marrow transplant better in a more recent uh, era? Uh, and they look at 6,000 severe aplastic anemia and compare the results. And when I say uh, severe aplastic anemia, I mean neutrophil count. This is not of course, my definition is standard definition. Very severe is less than 200 neutrophils. Severe is 200 to 500 neutrophils. And non-severe is greater than 500 neutrophils. So when we look at um, this slide, you can see that immunosuppressive drug, immunosuppressive therapy here, earlier and after 1999, bone marrow transplantation earlier and after 1999. Um, so the, what you can see to me, um, as expected, uh, the older group had more immunosuppressive therapy and bone marrow transplantation group in a earlier age got more uh, uh, transplantation. So the, what strike me here that the, uh, the over more recent years, even though patients who were assigned to get immunosuppressive therapy, 44% the of them eventually receive bone marrow transplantation. And in bone marrow transplantation group, in more recent years, um, they even older patients, bone marrow transplantation was applied in a higher rate. So bone marrow transplantation in severe aplastic anemia seems to be one very another reason has been used in severe aplastic anemia in more recent years. So you may know or not that the um, bone marrow transplantation and immunosuppressive drugs therapy outcomes uh, significantly change by age. Therefore, whenever you look at the uh, how do we treat severe aplastic anemia? It comes with always age. What is the patient age? So the younger age here in this European study, uh, less than 20 years, severe aplastic anemia. And if they and uh, look at in two time periods, let's we look at the focus on the more recent years, uh, 2000, since 2000 or 1999, bone marrow transplantation, seem to give better outcomes, not statistically significant, but better outcomes over uh, immunosuppressive therapy. Uh, second group is age 21 to 40. And here again, more recent years, bone marrow transplantation um, seem to give better overall survival than immunosuppressive therapy. However, if you look at um, 40 and older patients, immunosuppressive therapy is better. So age is important, how to treat these patients. Um, and this is a study in uh, bone marrow transplantation showing that if we are gonna do bone marrow transplantation, the, the donor, is it, does donor matter unrelated or sibling? These are HLA match patients, uh, donor uh, transplant. So donor and recipient has uh, HLA match, uh, um, match each other. It can be sibling or unrelated. And you will always see that in aplastic anemia. It's not like MDS. Uh, siblings are better. Uh, here, uh, blue is in siblings. Uh, the siblings in blue curve match related. And much match unrelated is in green dotted curve. And there is a difference. Match is about 90%. And um, uh, unrelated donor is 80%. It's still very good numbers, 80%, 90% survival after transplantation. Uh, and this is greater than 18 years old, adult patients. 
but there's a difference. Uh, sibling do uh, does better. The same thing for younger children, pediatric population, it's almost 90, 90 to 100% survival after allogeneic sibling transplantation. And allogeneic unrelated donor transplantation is in 90s, 85 to 90s. So a transplantation in younger group gives, provides tremendously good outcomes. This is a European study. You can see the age matters. Um, as age goes down, the transplantation outcomes go down and unrelated group on the right hand side uh, is slightly lower than siblings in age match um, curves. So the another transplantation studies just, you know, two years ago came and showed again, patients who are older than uh, 30 years old in blue dotted curve did worse than patients younger than 30 years old. Again, age matters in transplantation outcomes after allogeneic transplantation for severe uh, aplastic anemia. But both curves are still, you can see that 75% to 95% uh, for transplantation, very high outcomes. And again, this is an academic maybe, but what we use before transplantation, what chemotherapy, radiation therapy, also uh, make a little bit of differences, better or worse. So this is a very widely accepted standard algorithms. How do we treat acquired severe aplastic anemia? Age is matter and, and donor type is matter. So you can see that if there is an HLA match sibling, then we look at age. If it is age is less than 40 or equal to 40, that person should receive sibling transplantation, bone marrow transplantation. Bone marrow transplantation in aplastic anemia is absolutely critical and better than uh, peripheral blood stem cells. Uh, so, because GVHT is less, uh, and that's one of the diseases that uh, it comes. And so, if the patient has um, sibling transplant, but 41 and 60 years old, okay, what to do now? The the it's not if it is older, we know that transplant outcomes goes down. Immunosuppressive therapy outcomes also goes down. However, they are perhaps at the same level and, and, and maybe immunosuppressive therapy is a little bit better than the therapy is immunosuppressive therapy. Uh, but these patients can go also sibling transplant. It's a good, this needs to be a good discuss at that point. Uh, even expressive therapy is the anti globulin and cytosporin. This is the immunosuppressive therapy and, and may provide good outcome. However, this is very important. If you are assigned in, uh, or your person that the person that you know, severe aplastic anemia is assigned or receiving uh, immunosuppressive therapy, well, think this. Um, you, you, this person is already very prone to develop infections. Why? Because there is no white cells, good enough white cells. On top of it, you are giving immunosuppressive drugs so that the infection risk really gets higher and higher for these patients. It needs to be, and any infection can be very, very critical. More than that, they need to get the blood transfusions. They need to get platelet transfusions. So they are, they have to be observed and seen by doctors all the time too. Therefore, having this therapy is not does not mean that you are good to go. You have to be followed very carefully. And and if four months later, response officially should be evaluated around four months. If you don't have, if that person doesn't have a good response, doesn't, do not delay transplantation. Why? Because every time you get blood transfusions, platelet transfusion, your body start building up antibodies for this outside cells, out, someone else cells. And stem cells are someone else cells too, so that the, the person can reject the coming cells. And moreover, over time, people can develop these opportunistic infections and 
after transplantation, they can find a way to grow and cause significant problems. So, so the, uh, in immunosuppressive, on an immunosuppressive therapy, it's okay if your age and disease a lot um, makes you, uh, the immunosuppressive therapy seems to be better. However, if you are not, that person is not responding, delaying the transplantation is not a good idea because it will decrease the outcomes after transplantation. So if the person is um, less than 20 years old um, and not having sibling, but unrelated donor, can sh that person should get transplant or immunosuppressive therapy? It depends. Again, uh, this the, the required good discussions. If the person has uh, um, no sibling and 40 to 60 years old, they should get um, ATG and cytosporin. If they don't have any response, they should get um, transplantation. The same uh, in for, for patients 60 years old and older, they should get immunosuppressive therapy. If they don't respond, maybe second time immunosuppressive therapy. And if they don't respond, perhaps transplantation, depending on how fit they are, um, et cetera. And as I mentioned, this half match transplantation have changed the, uh, the landscape of transplantation, really, uh, in particularly the malignant transplant, uh, malignant diseases. And as severe aplastic anemia is an orphan disease, but John Hopkins group looked and who created this um, uh, haplo match uh, landscape also looked at uh, severe aplastic anemia. As you can see, it's only 37 patients. It's expected. It's not going to be hundreds or thousands of patients. And, and there were all kinds of patients from age 4 to 69, and they are uh, having severe aplastic anemia. <clears throat> As you notice here, <clears throat> uh, these patients had directly went to transplantation or they failed immunosuppressive therapy and came to transplantation. Acute and chronic GVHT rates very uh, 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 reasonable. And here the survival. Look, if, if you look at this, 100%, um, nobody died uh, in relapsed refractory patients. Uh, but in patients who had who directly went to the transplantation had some issues because they rejected the coming cells. And then they looked at it and they figured out how they can improve it, uh, this rejection, uh, the, um, the host, the patient rejecting the coming cells. And they figured out, they think that it is related to um, uh, radiation dose before transplant. However, this is the detail. Uh, what we see is here, half match transplantation half match transplantation may provide 80 to 100% survival in patients who have severe aplastic anemia. So that tells you that uh, the donor issue will not be a big issue even uh, in this era in severe aplastic anemia with half match. We don't have obviously hundreds of patients, but that is very promising data. And lastly, I want to talk about uh, uh, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, PNH. PNH is very interesting disease. Uh, there is a, a genetic mutation in the PIGA genes and that in the stem cells and affects the, the maturated cells from these stem cells. And as a result of it, the red blood cells are affected mostly and that are prone to now dying early. We call it hemolysis. Uh, so the patient tried to make blood red cells. Unfortunately, his own uh, system recognized them abnormal and they are abnormal and kills them. And constantly making and breaking, making, breaking, obviously is, is abnormal and, and patient will have been feeling tired and hemoglobin will be low and the heart will be trying to compensate the situations and beating faster and faster and faster. The platelets also get affected and they are abnormal and they try to do unnecessary clotting. Uh, and, and this clotting, we call it, you know, DVT is the deep venous thrombosis or arterial thrombosis. So the clots in the vessels 
obviously it's a big deal. We can have stroke, we can have a heart attack, we can have this um, clots in our legs or, or uh, uh, and, and this can be life-threatening. That is PNH and PNH patients, this PNH uh, can go to aplastic anemia or, or MDS. It can be, uh, it is one of the bone marrow failure syndrome. So obviously PNH uh, is a, nowadays we figured out how the standard therapy for PNH is to block the, the red cells dying earlier. And, and there are really good medications came and, and it's really changed the uh, survival of these patients and they are the standard therapies. However, there is a small group of in this small disease may require transplantation. Uh, this is a French study I'm showing you. Uh, look at retrospectively uh, in hundreds of patients, not thousands, or as you can imagine, it's uh, 160 uh, patients. And the survival was around 70% after transplantation. Um, when they look at subgroup, what symptoms were more prominent in these patients and how did they do? What they saw that uh, patients with the recurrent hemolysis breaking the red cells did better, 85 to 90%. The patients that who look like apoplastic anemia or up in the apoplastic anemia, but had PNH clone, we call it clone, they did okay, 70%. But patients had recurrent clots. They didn't do that well. They uh, 50 to 60 percent. So the today is the recommended algorithms in uh, PNH treatment. Uh, in most patients are going to be on this side. Uh, the vast majority they are hemolyzing, meaning that red cells are breaking through. In that group. The, the the treatment is um, anti CD, C5 complement inhibition or eculizumab kind of therapies is standard and but a small uh, fraction will have a plastic anemia appearance. The bone marrow is failed. Bone marrow is not not only the red cells but the white cells are low. Um, platelets are low. And in these populations, if they have sibling, they should go to transplantation like aplastic anemia, treat them like severe aplastic anemia. The other group, perhaps this PNH, again, something wrong in the stem cells, we know that may progress to the more aggressive diseases like AML and maybe five to 10% lifetime, that patients needs to get to transplantation. Like, as I mentioned, 15 to 20% may progress to, or at the same time has bone marrow failure, they should get the transplantation as well. Um, the patients at recurrent clots do not do well after transplantation and transplantation is not recommended for that patients. Uh, having said, I think I'm completing my talk and I will be more than happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Yes, we do have a few questions. Uh, <clears throat> the first is, you stated that is, uh, SCT stem cell transplantation should be used for high-risk patients. I am a 75-year-old patient, a low-risk patient, in good health who has failed all other treatments and is now on red blood cell transfusions every two weeks. Would SCT provide a better survival outcome? Very good question. So it, that's very individual question. When we say high risk, we we mention cytogenetic abnormalities and blood count mainly. But on the other hand, have I done transplantation who has required uh, red blood cell transfusion very frequently? Yes, I did because uh, in that in in that um, patients. Um, the 
the quality of life is not good. You have to get transfusions every one, two weeks, and then you develop transfusions related, related problems, what they are, iron overload. Every time you get red blood cells, you have iron in your body, 200 milligram or so, and it deposits, deposits in your major organs, the liver, heart, and etc. And over time, that causes organ problems. So it depends what, um, how, how the blood counts, how you look, uh, and what type of transfusion requirement you need. But doesn't, to me, yes, it can be done. It needs to be calculated very well and discussed with you. But I will not exclude you, you will not, you as a transplant is not indicated in your case. It can be. Uh, to me, uh, blood transfusions um, e affecting your life and will affect your life more because the two every two weeks is going to go down to every week. That is inevitable because your disease will progress and your response to transfusions will get worse. So it is highly, uh, it's discussion is needed. I cannot say yes or no, but absolutely can be considered. Thank you. Another question. Are the half match results the same as sibling matches in the various scenarios you mentioned? Very good question too. Uh, half match matches is almost uh, it, it disease dependent. And we have really good data over 10 years now that it is, it, it is as good as in some diseases. Uh, uh, for example, malignancies, my, uh, AML and MDS. Um, and in some diseases, a plastic anemia or, or PNH, it still, I show you good data, very promising data, but too early. I, I wouldn't say how blood transplantation is standard in a plastic anemia. I wouldn't say that. However, uh, in some other diseases, we have already thousands of patients and their uh, survival is similar to unrelated match or sibling match uh, patients. So it is a, uh, it's, uh, we will accumulate more data in some of the diseases, but for MDS, I will, I will have, I will not hesitate. I will say, yes, it will be very similar. Thank you. Um, you certainly touched on this during your presentation, but can you review all, again, um, the post transplant considerations that that families need to need to we take into account when when considering bone marrow uh, transplantation as an option. Yeah, well, it's it's a very good question, and that's that can be a important. Uh, and it is caregivers are really really important for allergenic transplantation because we ask uh, uh, patients to take uh, ten pills per day, and some of it can be very confusing. Our pharmacists help our. Uh, provider self, we make sometimes to, you know, weekly uh, medications. However, um, it, things can change uh, dramatically after allergenic transplant, GVHT and infection. So they have to be followed very carefully and therefore uh, they have to stay around the transplantation. Generally accepted length is 100 days, uh, very close to the hospital. But if something happens, we have to they can reach the hospital directly to the transplant team uh, right away. That's important. Um, and, and families, uh, you know, if they are living 45 minutes away, they can go home. If they are not, if they are living two hours away, they have to stay in the guest house. Most hospitals have that get, get guest house for patients. And, and someone has to stay with them if it is in guest house. If it is home, again, someone has to stay with them. If it is home and, dri uh, and driving 45 hours, three times a week, for example, for the first 100 days, then someone has to drive them. And, and therefore, how, you know, everybody works. How do you do this? How do you organize this? This is, a, this is our people are extremely helpful. We talk with the family, family members, friends come temporarily. It is done. It's, it can be done. 
but uh, requires a lot of discussions, teachings, what is required, what needs to be done, um, and, and can it be, uh, most of our patients do it. And, uh, but again, we have social workers, we give all kinds of uh, letters required for the caregivers and patients, staying out of the work, et cetera. Thank you. And uh, now, of course, we're still in the COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, I'm sure you've been giving guidance to your both pre- and post-transplant patients. Can you summarize the key points you've been sharing with your patients as a, as a reminder to many of our patients, because they've been staying well-informed about this also, but just, just from your perspective, what you've been telling your patients both pre-transplant, those considering transplant, and those who have been through, have had the transplant done? All right. So very good questions too. And we are living this, uh, we have been living this for interesting one and a half years all together. And things have been changing dramatically, as you know, um, you know, last month is not the same uh, what we are saying uh, today. But um, the best is to prevention. I can tell you this, but this is a really interesting virus. I had my own patients, uh, we, and we published our data, uh, we did. A very interesting virus. I have never, never seen personally that kind of virus. Um, so it's scary, I, I have to say. And therefore it's better to prevent this virus. Um, we do get infections. Our patients get infections all the time. But this is very odd, and it's better to not to catch infection. So what I suggest before transplantation, obviously staying out of crowd for sure, masks and, um, and vaccinations. So the vaccinations wise, uh, uh, people before transplantation, I will say, go get vaccinated if, if the transplantation is three months from now. But if it is only 10 days, I will say don't get vaccinated because very likely we are going to wipe out your immune system and try to bring you new immune system. So uh, pre-vaccination vaccination and pre-transplant vaccination is very, very important to vaccines, whatever the type of vaccine you are getting. But if it is very close to transplant and you that person has not vaccinated, perhaps uh, uh, keeping the vaccinations after transplantation. After transplantation, we recommend everybody, all transplant patients get vaccinated. Generally speaking, one day, 100 days, that's kind of standard national recommendations now, because even you vaccinate before, before 100 days, likely they are not gonna boost uh, immune system against the virus 100 days after we vaccinate them. If someone had, vaccinated before transplantation, shall we revaccinate them and give them boosters? That is ongoing debate. It's changing every day, but I think the answer is yes, because transplantation uh, decreases or really maybe um, get rid of the prior memory of vaccinations so we have to rebuild again after transplantation. So even person who got vaccinated before transplantation, we started vaccinating them after transplantation. Uh, if the person had two vaccinations after vaccination, after transplantation, we are certainly recommending as the uh, new guidelines for the third boost vaccination for immunosuppressive patients. So patients who are on immunosuppressive drug like aplastic anemia or, uh, or MDS, they are immunosuppressed too. And, and they should be treated like immunosuppressed patients. And as far as I know, uh, the third vaccination is recommended to boost their uh, immune uh, antibodies against virus. I, I strongly, strongly recommend this is to prevent yourself from vaccination from this virus. It's really interesting virus. It's, it's scary virus to prevent it as the best thing you can do. 
thank you. And um, what is your advice for uh, patients who, who have gone through transplant and their ongoing treatment afterwards with, especially with other, other um, healthcare providers, like they're perhaps a primary care physician or other, others, other physicians that they see for other conditions or just on a regular basis? How, how do you advise their communication for that? Very good question too. Uh, so it's um, obviously communications, 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 but now this triangle, right? The uh, academic center, community doctor and, and the patient, we have to communicate very well uh, for the sake of patients. Um, and it's very important. Um, and it, it is absolutely necessary, but also institution dependent and I, the practice I am at Rush University now we 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 communicate, but we also do what we do. We certainly it's institutional preference, and we like to um, have our patients for a while after allergenic transplantation, or that for a while can be a year, if can be two years, um, because this. Uh, the the graft versus host disease and infections and 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 if the MDS will come back or or aplastic anemia will come back or not uh, we we try to handle that by ourselves to do some degrees and then patients go to the community doctors when they are very very stable. And before that, we communicate with the community doctors and tells them tell them that this is this is what we do, and we recommend. In it, if we do that, also we ask them to come back periodically, uh, six months or twelve months. Um, we will certainly keep our uh, contact with our patients a uh, very very long time, and they have our numbers very. They can reach us for any any questions even five years later, six years later, nine years later. I think that is critical. Patients should have to have that kind of relationship with the transplant center. And community doctors also can able to, should be able to reach the transplant centers for any time. If they have any questions, again, communications is the key here. Thank you. We don't have any other questions today. So with that, we'll thank you, Dr. Ustin, for your time and expertise today. If you would like to watch this session at a later time, it will be available on the conference platform in the next hour by accessing the session and clicking on replay or by navigating the on-demand tab in the platform hub. If we were not able to answer your question today, you can send it to us at any time in three ways. You can send an email to help at aamds.org you can call the AAMDSIF helpline at 800-747-2820, extension 2, or you can submit a question on our Facebook page. Be sure to view the exhibit hall today that's accessible through the meeting platform. Our support groups will start in, in approximately 15 minutes. On behalf of the Aplastic Anemia and MDS International Foundation, Thank you for joining us today and for making us your resource of choice for information on bone marrow failure diseases. The AAMDSIF Medical Advisory Board and team are here to help you and your family as we have for the past 37 years. This concludes the session. Thanks so much.